Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce the idea of Evaluability Assessment, or EA. I'll try to explain why it's a good idea and the steps involved in conducting one. Now, to understand why EA might be useful, it's useful to think about why we evaluate interventions in the first place. The general answer is to see whether they're worthwhile, taking into account both the positive and the negative effects and the overall cost of the intervention. Now we do this for several reasons. It's to improve the quality of intervention design and delivery, to inform investment and disinvestment decisions, and to strengthen the wider evidence base. The problem is that not every new or existing intervention can be usefully evaluated, and there's a very wide range of evaluation approaches and methods. Evaluation is costly and resources uh, can easily be wasted. So how do we decide whether and how to evaluate interventions? So one approach is to conduct an evaluability assessment. This is a systematic, collaborative approach to the planning of evaluation projects. It involves engaging stakeholders, clarifying intervention goals, developing a theory of change, and working together to decide whether a useful evaluation be carried out at reasonable costs. And it's been usefully described as a low-cost pre-evaluation activity to prepare better for the conventional evaluation of some programmes, practices and policies. Evaluability assessment was developed in the US in the 1970s in response to the failures of the, great society, of the evaluation of the Great Society programmes. There was very substantial investment in evaluating these programmes, but many of the evaluations showed no effect, and this led to a backlash against public spending on programmes of this kind. But when the evaluation studies themselves were reviewed, it became evident that many of the programmes had such unclear goals or were so badly implemented that evaluation was uninformative. EA methods were developed both to improve the quality and usefulness of the evaluation studies and also to improve the quality and effectiveness of the programmes that were being evaluated. In the UK, evaluability assessment has been most widely used to evaluate uh, development projects, but there's now growing interest in its application to public health interventions, such as the Healthy Towns Initiative, and the responsibility deal. And my colleagues and I have recently conducted several EAs in Scotland and I'll be using one of those on the list, the evaluation, evaluability assessment of the Family Nurse Partnership, as a worked example in the remainder of the lecture. So what can EA offer? Well, in the first place it can help to clarify intervention goals and the likelihood of measurable impact before you commit resources to a full-scale evaluation. It can enable constructive engagement with stakeholders whether or not you go ahead to do a full-scale evaluation. You can avoid committing evaluation resources if there's little real ex realistic expectation of benefit, and it can make the evaluations that are undertaken more useful. So how do you do an evaluability assessment? Well, EA is meant to be a flexible approach, and the amount of time and effort required at the different stages will vary according to the complexity and stage of development of the intervention, and also the extent of existing literature that you have to draw on. An evaluability assessment should usually involve the six stages shown on this slide. Looking at the stages of the process in more detail, the first task is to pull together a team to conduct the EA. As the process is quite brief and the deadlines tend to be short, it's best if you make the roles of everybody involved clear at the outset. The same goes for the client. It's useful to set out the terms of reference for the EA, what the research team can deliver, and what's expected of the client in terms of attendance at meetings and turning around reports right at the beginning of the process. Having pulled the team together, some preparatory work will be needed before you do the first workshop. You need to identify existing literature and sources of routinely collected data and develop a draft theory of change. This theory of change will form the focus of the first workshop with stakeholders. Those are the policy makers, practitioners, analysts and others who are responsible for the intervention and who will make the ultimate decision about whether to go ahead with an evaluation. The aim of the first workshop is to further develop the theory of change. If the intervention is a complicated one, then this may take more than one meeting. How many meetings you need will depend on how straightforward it is to identify the data sources and develop the evaluation option. If it has been challenging to develop the evaluation options, for example because resources are very limited or there are strong views amongst the stakeholders about the right approach, then a final meeting to work through the pros and cons of all the different options is probably a good investment of time. There's no minimum or maximum number of meetings you need in the process, but as meetings take time to arrange and are costly in terms of people's time and effort, and ideally you want to keep the whole process as short as possible, keep the number of meetings you hold to the reasonable minimum.
Now, I'd like to illustrate the key elements of the EA process by discussing one of the EAs that I undertook with colleagues on behalf of the Scottish Government. We were asked to conduct an EA of the Family Nurse Partnership. This is an intervention for first-time teenage mothers, and it replaces the standard care during pregnancy and the early years provided by health visitors with a more intense programme of visits provided by specially trained nurses. Now, the first stage of the EA process, as always, was to develop the theory of change. The theory of change is a model or a description of how a policy or a programme achieves its overall aims through a logical sequence of intermediate outcomes. It's often developed using a backward mapping approach, starting with a long-term outcome and moving back through the required process of change, taking into account the short-term, medium-term outcomes required to achieve the ultimate goals. A theory of change can also be used to clarify the assumptions and identify relevant contextual factors affecting the outcomes of the intervention. An important feature of a theory of change is that it's method neutral. In other words, it doesn't automatically lead to one preferred approach to evaluation. Theories of change can be very complicated, but they're built out of the core elements shown on the slide. If the intervention is very complex, it can be helpful to break it down into its component parts and work out how each of them is expected to operate before putting all the separate theories back together into an overall theory of change. Now, the Family Nurse Partnership is a tightly prescribed intervention that can only be implemented under licence. The theory of change provided by the developers of the intervention is very complex. We undertook a series of workshops with stakeholders to identify the outcomes that were most important to them. We built up the theory of change from elements such as the ones shown on this slide. The stakeholders included policy makers, senior practitioners and managers involved in delivering the intervention and analysts involved in monitoring the programme. The unit responsible for delivering the FNP collects very detailed process and outcome data and in the course of the workshops and through additional meetings with stakeholders we were able to identify a number of important outcomes that were routinely measured in all pregnancies in Scotland. This kind of routinely collected data creates opportunities for evaluation at much lower cost than if you need to gather all the data as primary data and this widens the range of evaluation designs that you can consider within a given budget. We also learnt during the workshops that the way the FNP had been delivered in Scotland created a natural experiment. The recruitment of teenage first-time mothers into the programme stopped and started at different times in different areas according to the capacity of trained nurses in those areas. This meant that the women who gave birth during periods of recruitment should be very similar to women in their area who gave birth shortly before or after recruitment period. This means that once enough women had been through the programme, then comparing outcomes in the two groups should give us a precise and unbiased estimate of the impact of the programme, at least for those outcomes that are measured in all pregnancies in Scotland. For the appraisal of evaluation options, we considered three approaches in detail. The first was to use the monitoring information collected by the FNP unit with no additional collection or linkage of data. This would involve little extra cost, but lacking a comparator, we wouldn't get any direct estimate of the impact of the programme. The second option was to treat the FNP as a natural experiment, and to link data identifying participants with data on all women who were eligible for the scheme, but who gave birth at a time when there was no recruitment into the programme in their area. The pros and cons of this approach are set out on the slide. The key advantages are that we would get um, a large sample relatively quickly and cheaply. The main drawback is that we would be limited to the outcome measures that are available in the routinely collected data. The third option was to conduct a cluster randomised trial along the lines of a trial that was already in progress uh, in England and Wales. The pros and cons of this approach are a mirror image of those of the natural experimental approach. It would allow much greater control of the choice of outcome measures, but at a much higher cost because of the extra expense of gathering all the primary outcome data and conducting and managing a large trial. So in our final report, we recommended option two, coupled with an economic evaluation and a process evaluation. We prepared the report following a further meeting with stakeholders to set out and discuss the options, and an evaluation based on the recommended design has now been commissioned in Scotland. So what lessons have we learnt from the process? Well, the first is that EAs are helpful to decision makers. It helps them to understand their own programmes better and also to understand the con constraints on evaluation design 
and what an evaluation can and can't deliver. Researchers also benefit from being engaged in the process by developing a shared understanding of the programme theory and the constraints and evaluation design. This process should lead to more realistic expectations of evaluation and to better develop research specifications and invitations to tender. EAs are most useful, we've learnt, when resources have already been earmarked for evaluation, but when there's genuine uncertainty about whether and how best to evaluate. If you'd like to try out an evaluability assessment before tackling one in real life, have a look at the examples on the next couple of slides. Choose one of these, or think of one of your own, and then work through the process that I've outlined. This will work better and it'll certainly be much more enjoyable if you get a group of colleagues together to do it with you. Begin by developing and sketching out, and I mean literally sketching out using a whiteboard, a theory of change for the intervention. Think about what the key outcomes are, what are the processes and intermediate outcomes that lead to them, and that link the ultimate outcomes back to the components of the intervention. Next, think about how you would measure all these outcomes, the intermediate and the ultimate outcomes. Think about what kinds of data sources that you would use and where the gaps are that could only be filled by primary data collection. And then finally, think about the evaluation options. What kind of study design would you need to identify the effects of the intervention? How will you create a comparable control group? We're not exposed to the intervention. How will you analyse the data to estimate treatment effects? How large do you think the impacts will be? And what are the implications for the sample sizes that you would need to get usefully precise estimates? Next, think about what sort of information you would need to understand the process by which change is achieved. Would you need qualitative data, quantitative information, or both? And then finally, if there's a range of evaluation options, and remember there's always the option of doing nothing, think about how the options compare in terms of the cost and quality of the information they might provide. Is there a clearly preferred option that you would want to recommend to the stakeholders? If you'd like to find out more about evaluability assessment, there are some papers and other reports listed on the final slide. I hope you will consider using the method and that you find it as useful as we have done.